Ladies and gentlemen, at the World Cloud Show, it is now time for a government panel discussion on the cloud model, cloud leading the road of the African e-government services. We're looking and talking about the legal framework and strategies for the cloud deployment in Africa, how to improve citizen services using cloud technologies, smart cities and cloud technologies, challenger or enabler, that's the question, cloud versus data centers, national security concerns of the data storage and management, and digital native youth as a future of digital transformation for Africa. Well, we're joined now by our eminent panelists. First up, we're joined by Colin Mugasha Babikuru, uh, Babiru Kamu, the Director, E-Government Services, National Information Technology Authority, Uganda. Colin has 20 years in the IT industry in uh, East Africa as an experience. He's currently running over 185 shared government applications and growing the e-services in the National Cloud Data Center, Uganda. Thank you so much, Colin, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ravana. Thank you. Glad to be here. Also now joining us on the stage and screen is Richard M. Kiari, the Principal ICT Officer, Head Policy and Research Unit, Ministry of ICD Innovation and Youth Affairs, Republic of Kenya. With 30 years of experience in the ICD industry, Richard currently heads the research policy and innovation docket of the Ministry of ICD Innovation and Youth Affairs. Thank you so much, Richard, for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much and good morning, everybody. We hope to share as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. We're also now joined by Temba Manguni, the Deputy Director, IT Audit, Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, South Africa. Well, Temba is the data science professional with experience in cyber, computer forensics, and counterterrorism. He is certified ethical hacker and is leading the way for technology in rural development and land reform. Thank you so much, Temba, for joining us today. Thanks, uh, Pavana, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thanks for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, now it is time for me to introduce to you the moderator of this panel discussion. We're now joined on the stage and screen by Humphrey Odiambo, the Head of Partnerships and Content CIO, East Africa, Kenya. As the Head of Partnerships and Content at CIO, East Africa, Humphrey develops the thematic programs and schedules various digital transformation summits and forums. With a proven track record in content generation and organizing virtual events, his work entails putting together a steady and appealing flow of themed content in either physical conferences or hybrid oriented events, virtual webcast productions through internal ideation and external dissemination. Thank you so much, Humphrey, for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Bavana. It's always a pleasure to connect with the uh, Trescon, and thanks to my panel who are so gracious to accept uh, to be part of this panel. Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, with this, if you may have any questions, please drop it up in the Q and A section. We'll take it up uh, at the end of the session if time allows. But I'm not going to come in between this uh, incredible session, so I'm going to take the live reign now to Humphrey to take it forward. Over to you. Great. Uh, uh, my gratitude again, Bavana, and uh, to my pan panelists. Uh, thanks so much. We are actually covering the beta cross section of uh, Africa, and our key topic uh, this uh, morning, for some, wherever you are, it is probably afternoon, but uh, thanks all the same for joining us. Key to our discussion is cloud leading the road for African e-government. Uh, indeed, we need uh, proper e-governance for us to make an impact, even as we transition to the next uh, level of our engagement, be it in business or be it in serving uh, citizens accordingly. So it's so gracious to have Richard. And I would like to just uh, kindly ask you, Richard, based on the legal frameworks and strategies that have been in place so far, uh, Richard, in your own understanding, cloud technology and its impact, uh, would you let us know to what extent has that technology been embraced in uh, Kenya? 
Thank, thank you, Humphrey. Uh, cloud actually is the way to go because most people have realized that it is actually leading to cost reduction. Uh, you also get uh, top-notch services because essentially what happens is if I subscribe to cloud services, let's say whether it's software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, the cloud provider is already assuring me that they are going to give me the best service. So I'll just be, whether they're updates or anything like that, I'll always be sure that I'm going to get the best updates, the best infrastructure and so forth. Well, I work for the government and in the government, we realized that uh, we had a lot of uh, redundant ICT capacity. And so we thought that it would be prudent if we could have our own private cloud in our own data centers and where we can possibly put in our applications and then now people can access the applications or whatever service they required from anywhere. And we have seen that it is really working. It is more efficient. And even the citizenry is actually uh, adapting to that particular aspect. And I think that is the way we are headed for. Thank you, Humphrey. Yeah, thanks so much, Richard, for your very, very kind response. Uh, Colin, kindly just uh, let us know the status in Uganda in reference to the frameworks that have been put in place and how uh, the technology has so far been embraced in the country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Humphrey, and, and greetings to everybody uh, at the uh, World Cloud Show. I mean, um, this, this is very, is very key question, I think, when it comes to uh, e-governance and the legal frameworks that are, uh, for instance, in Uganda, in respect to Uganda. So it's been about 10 years now, uh, Humphrey, uh, that we've uh, had uh, steady regulatory reforms for this sector, especially pointing towards this sort of uh, efficiency. Um, 10 years ago, the, there was a National IT Authority Act where we work right now that then positioned NITA Uganda, or the National IT Authority, as that central organization that is uh, mandated to oversee, to regulate, to consolidate, to rationalize IT resources for the country. And I think that's very important that every country has an authority whose focus is to promote rationalization and efficient use of ICT. We also saw uh, data, uh, you know, uh, data bank regulations, which allow central uh, storage of data for the whole country. And that of course pushes the country to integrate its uh, siloed databases around the country. We also saw uh, uh, the passing of an e-government regulations. Again, uh, this again allows uh, e-services or e-government services to take center stage and a cloud first uh, strategy. And of course, most recently we've seen a data protection and privacy act uh, being passed in, in Uganda. So we've had a series of, of frameworks and what this has done, uh, Humphrey, in the last, in the last uh, maybe four or five years now, after the laws were put in place, we have seen Uganda shift from um, what it was before with very, very siloed, independent data centers um, by different ministries, departments, agencies. And we, they had siloed applications. Uh, we had uh, different platforms, different networks. And that push has now been driven by NITA, uh, which is that authority that the act put in place and the Ministry of ICT, which is a very focused ministry. Again, a very important step in, in digitizing any country. We have begun to see a shift towards centralizing uh, these services. And very quickly, e-governance for us, uh, for anybody who's watching, obviously, is really the, the secure and convenient and cost-effective delivery of public services to citizens. And in Uganda, our target in the next three years is to take 80% of our citizens online. We want to get 80% of our citizens receiving services online. Now, obviously the current situation and what has been before is that we had to queue up. You had to queue up for service delivery. You had to queue up for lineup uh, for services, just about every office you went to. And every office you went to did not talk to the other government office. 
So you had to duplicate, replicate, you know, uh, forms, physical forms. You had to recapture your biometrics everywhere you went. But what has happened now, uh, as uh, we have now created in the last three, four years, a national data center, which is a private cloud, quite similar to what Richard mentioned in Kenya. We have a national data center uh, and imagine that now the application has gone down that we had previously. We had multiple data centers uh, by ministries. Now we have one large private cloud. It's easy provisioning. Imagine what procurement would take five months for you to buy servers, infrastructure, networks. Now you can on demand requested in five minutes. In five minutes, you can actually have a provisioning of resources, uh, you know, be it, uh, you know, CPU, you know, RAM and, and, and compute and storage. So it's a five, five minutes versus a five months procurement. And that's the kind of efficiency that, 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 that centralized cloud data centers bring to governments. Of course, it's become a greener uh, affair for us, a greener ICT affair, because you have less uh, wastage in terms of energy and, and the efficiency that comes with it. But in a sense, in summary, uh, Humphrey, uh, the government now provides uh, you know, infrastructure as a service. It's moving to platform as a service. It has software as a service because we have shared applications now running out of our cloud data center, things like HR for the whole government, uh, e-procurement for the whole government and infrastructure. And lastly, also uh, data center has become such a foundation for e-procurement because on top of that now, you know, we have integration platforms for the whole government. So governments can now link up and talk to each other. We have things like PKI now being implemented or public key infrastructure, e-signatures, having a paperless uh, government. Uh, we are now also working to having an e-citizens portal and an e-citizens app for easier access. So ultimately it's a one government approach. It's a build once and use many approach in Uganda. And we are on this journey uh, so far, Humphrey. I'm happy to share more as we go along. You're so passionate about this, Colin. I could, <laughs> I could uh, barely even stop you, sir. Thanks so much. This there has been tremendous, indeed, uh, transformation in Uganda, with that projection of eighty uh, percent uh, being connected uh, in Uganda. Really sounds to be quite uh, key. It would be interesting to know uh, when the next twenty uh, percent perhaps would be part of this uh, major transformation you're having in the country. Let's swing to South Africa. Mr. Themba, you're dealing right now with a segment that is really um, key to most of the African countries. I, I take note that you are the deputy director uh, in charge of land reform uh, within uh, the country. And when we are talking about cloud and digitai digitization, to what extent has there been an impact, particularly while using uh, cloud technology in this arena? So if you could share with us some of these aspects. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, uh, thanks, um, Free. Um, okay, um, in, in South Africa, um, let me start by saying at the moment, we are in the process of uh, establishing we, uh, what we call, and this is very much, it is very much important because um, it will give some guidance and clarity because when it comes to cloud, there is this, you know, thing of saying, especially when it comes to government, you are worried about your data sitting, for instance, in another country, or you are worried about your the controls around that. You are worried about uh, sensitive data that might be accessed or that might be seized, for instance. For instance, if your data is sitting in America, the American authorities they've got. The powers to seize your data if maybe they are investigating whatever they are investigating. So there are those, you know, uh, worries that um, uh, over the years the government departments were reluctant to use cloud. Now with this national data 
and cloud policy, the government is now, the government of South Africa is now leading the way to say, okay, this is our future. We need to embrace this technology, but in the process of doing that, how can we do it in a manner that will make sure that we protect the data of our citizens? We are being responsible and we are able to deliver the, 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 the services to our citizens. So this is, the, 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 this is, this is, um, um, uh, this is in the process now, probably by the end of this year, it's gonna be implemented. But however, uh, this pandemic, as we, as, as we all know, it is forcing us not to wait for policies, uh, even though it's not in practice, but it is forcing us. So when it comes to cloud, we, are, we have already adopted a number of cloud um, technologies that we've been, that, that we've been using. So, um, those cloud technologies have enabled us to make things a little bit easier for our citizens and for our different government departments to share the information, to share the data that is necessary, that will enable them to be able to deliver the service effectively. Uh, oh, fantastic, uh, Pemba. Uh, fantastic, Pemba. Uh, it, it would be great. Um, it would be great just to learn a lot more how you are actually collaborating with the private sector as well. Uh, Richard, <laughs> maybe, maybe I can swing back to you. I'm privileged to be in Kenya with you right now. Yeah. <laughs> you, could just let, you, could, you could let us know uh, the magnitude or the extent of uh, collaborative initiative that you are having with the private sector now that uh, digitization is a cross-cutting issue uh, amongst enterprises, and indeed for purposes of making the government also deliver uh, an impact to the services with impact to the citizens. To what extent has cloud been used uh, in this extent? Just collaboration between the private sector and the government to make an impact for services as you face the citizens. Uh, thank you, Humphrey. We appreciate that uh, the private sector is an important player in the whole digitization exercise. And actually in some of our data centers, we're having what we call the private public partnerships, the PPPs. Now we have encouraged uh, some private data centers uh, uh, to come up and we actually share information with them. Remember that we have a lot of data uh, which is collected by the government and possibly some people may want to use that data, for example, for analysis. They may want uh, to use that data for various uh, artifacts that we may want to develop. For example, if you are designing a road, you want to find out for the traffic uh, density, and that information, we have it from the Minister of Roads. We are collecting data on a real-time basis. We have cameras all over, part of it with the police and so forth. And instead of now having to go and do some surveys, why can't you just come to us and then we give you the data? So we're actually having now what they call an open data framework. So private uh, private partnership, we are it's on several fronts. First of all, we use the private data centers. We encourage the use of it. Uh, what we have done is that we have also given them uh, our fiber connectivity. Remember, we have what we call the National Optic Fiber Backbone Infrastructure, the NOFB. And what we have done is that we have laid out a fiber optic cable, which is terminated at, uh, at the county level. And we are actually encouraging people, if, for example, it's internet or the last mile, you can now tap on the resource that we have. So we have had a lot of uh, partnership with the private sectors. And we know that uh, even what we have done is that we have started up what we call the Konza Metropolis, uh, the Konza Data Center. And we're encouraging even the private citizens, instead of having your own infrastructure, we have a, a public cloud there. Just come and put your data there. And we have our security features. And you should be able now to have your data accessed from anywhere. So possibly, I don't know what, I don't want to take a lot of time. Possibly, I think that should actually be suffice for the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Richard, for sharing this. Uh, I believe, uh, Colin, you'd like to chime in on the same, uh, how the collaborative efforts are happening. And uh, Temba as well. Uh, just a minute uh, from you and two before we cross over to another topic. 
please, Alfred, just, just repeat that line again on the collaborative yeah. efforts. Great. We're discussing about the collaborative efforts that has been there between the private sector and the public sector. To what extent is this happening in Uganda so that we can get the real impact uh, as the government reaches out with services to the people? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I think there is, uh, it's, it's really young industry here, I must say, um, even the private sector, and, but we're seeing players now beginning to come in to actually partner with us. Um, for instance, now of late, we've actually seen a uh, private data centers also uh, come up to provide uh, you know, additional uh, resource for uh, private businesses. But from a citizen's perspective, We've heavily been running with it, uh, uh, you know, from, from the government uh, perspective, a data center. Just like uh, Richard said in Kenya, uh, we've also run, um, you know, a fiber optic ring around, around Uganda uh, with over 4,000 kilometers of fiber optic that is, you know, you know pushing out the, the internet uh, signal throughout the country. We expect that to move to about 7,000 kilometers in the next three years. So we're yet to fully cover the country. And what we have done is that to cover, cover parts of the country, we are now partnering with local telcos to actually be able to reach uh, the last mile. And that's been a very, very, very key strategy uh, because the government can't do it alone. So local telcos have also come into play. Local telcos also have cloud services, of course, uh, provided, and we are partnering with them on the e-services uh, front, because as you would imagine, the government again, will not be able to achieve uh, you know, full e-service provision and delivery without local uh, partnerships. So we've begun to see that um, you can go much, much further by actually working together. So I see telcos at the forefront and other um, local uh, private partners coming in and international partners coming in for uh, high-end data centers. But I think it's, it's a young industry, but I think we're beginning to see uh, that movement happening. But you're right, Humphrey, a partnership will be very key uh, in driving digitization uh, forward. Thank you. I'm sure, Temba, you would like to chime in on the same. Thanks so much, Colleen. Uh, yes, uh, it, it's inevitable. When uh, one really has to walk so far, they want to work with the partners. What extent is this happening in uh, South Africa? Temba, please. Mm, okay, thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Humphrey. Okay, in South Africa, um, the, 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 the fiber optic lines are mostly done by uh, tel, uh, telecom and other um, uh, private sectors such as your MTN and so forth. Um, and then, um, the, and then when, when, it, when it comes to the cloud itself, the partnership that we're having is not directly with the private sector, if, if, if I may put it like that. We've got what we call State Information Technology Agency, CETA. CETA is, 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 is the government agency which is responsible to provide cloud services for all the government departments. Then as I indicated earlier on that, we are in the process of developing a national data and cloud, uh, and cloud policy, which will enable the government departments to work with the private sector, which it, it, it will basically make it easier because you'll be having a guideline now. Uh, you'll be having a guideline in terms of how you can go about working with the private sector. What data can you, uh, what, what data can, can be saved uh, in the terms of the, of the private sector? Can you save sensitive data? They can you save classified data. They, you know those kind of guidelines. So at the moment we are trying to clarify all of those things. But at the moment, CETAN is responsible for all our cloud services. Um, 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 the, we do have our own data centers, and then the different private sectors they do provide some some, some cloud services on a, on a very small scales, like you know those. Con there, there are contracts that do exist between some government departments and some private um, and some private sector, but on a very small scale because this is still highly regulated in South Africa. But we are trying to ease up things so that you know all the government departments because let's face it, this will make things a little bit easier for our citizens. It will make it easier to deliver services to our citizens if we remove all of these barriers. Thanks, Samba. Thanks, Temba. Uh, once more. Uh... 
<clears throat> let's swing over to another topical issue, which would be highly transformative, even as we use the cloud technologies. There has been dramatic push indeed from Northern part uh, of Africa, particularly Egypt, uh, having cities which are highly smart. Uh, Kenya has been toying with the Kwanzaa city and Uganda possibly, Colin will uh, let us know just now how this push has been there or if there is a model uh, of this nature. Uh, first to Richard, uh, just let us know uh, how the cloud technology is likely to make a dramatic push in terms of actualizing the smart city, uh, Kwanzaa being one of the model, and if there is any other within the country that you'd like to mention at this juncture, sir. Thank you, Humphrey. Uh, true, we decided to have a smart city in Konza. And what really happened is that we put, we invested, the government invested a lot in infrastructure, especially IT infrastructure. They have data centers in Konza and they are encouraging even innovation uh, because normally what you do is that if you have an office, at Kwanzaa City, you are assured of high speed or, or bandwidth, internet connectivity. We also are uh, doing security systems there where you have uh, cameras all over. We are using AI to detect crime and, and even the water and energy supply is regulated uh, using the advanced AI systems. So what is happening is that uh, it's a model town and uh, we benchmarked with other cities, smart cities in the world. It is still at its infancy stage. So people have not yet realized the benefit or the purpose of this particular smart city. But Konza, we have actually a parastatal a government company called Konza Development uh, um, um, Technology Development Authority is trying to market, trying to show the people that yes, uh, if you want housing, if you want office space, if you want data, I mean a data center, uh, that is the place to be. And so far, a few companies actually have actually uh, gone in there. And what you're actually saying that you actually do not even require heavy investment even in computers, you just require the clients. Then you access their data centers, you can download your software from there, you can do whatever you want to do from there, but you are still at the infants uh, stage. Thank you, Humphrey. Colin, please. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. Thank you. Um, Humphrey, I mean, uh, it's really good to hear even from Richard and uh, what's happening in, in, uh, in Kenya and Konza because uh, we're definitely uh, not even in infancy, as, as he mentioned. I think we're really uh, brainstorming, having conversations and conceptualizing, uh, you know, the viability of, of smart cities, uh, especially in Uganda. It's true that we, I think from 2017 or 2018, 2016 actually, there were conversations uh, of the same that were initiated but there's a lot to learn yet, a lot to pick up, you know, from our neighbors and from those who have done it, uh, done it well. Uh, we've only had um, progress around initiating and progressing with the smaller uh, ICT packs that we're trying to get off the ground and we're just trying to close those PPP partnerships. But that's way, way far off from the bigger uh, smart city concept. So there have been conversations around whether do you build a smart city, you know, all the way from scratch? I think that's what Richard is uh, referring to, which really allows it to, you know, from the design, you actually have a smart city rather than transforming an already existing, possibly colonial uh, built city uh, with all the legacy that comes with that city. So, uh, so Humphrey, we don't, uh, we haven't made much progress uh, in Uganda in terms of hitting the ground, but the conversations are taking place. And uh, obviously the building blocks, I think are now available. 
as a small landlocked country, we were grappling with having high speed internet connectivity, which is really uh, the basic for a smart city. I think now we've got that, it's becoming more and more affordable and we're having discussions of having uh, you know, redundant links throughout uh, the country, but we haven't yet hit the ground yet uh, for a smart city, Humphrey. But we hope to learn from our neighbors and I hope the next time we have a, you know, a world cloud show, I mean, we, we have better news. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's always need to uh, benchmark with those who are front runners in this case. Let's hear from Themba uh, just regarding the same. Okay. Themba, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Humphrey. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, Humphrey, um, uh, to hear from uh, my colleagues um, or my fellow pan panelists that African countries are starting to think along the lines of uh, smart cities and so forth, because uh, this will assist our economy big time. It will also assist service delivery. In South Africa, uh, we, we, we are still at our infancy straight stage. I don't know whether I, I, I should call it that. I should say we have started or what, but we haven't started doing anything yet, but officially the president has announced that uh, the South African government intends establishing a, a smart city. Now, it, 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 at, at the moment, it's not clear whether it's going to be <clears throat> the case of transforming one existing city into a smart city or a smart city is going to be started afresh. So it's not clear at this stage, but the, the government probably sometime next year, the government will be able to uh, clarified it, it, to, to, to indicate which path of establishing that smart city is going to be is going to be taken. Yeah, but at the moment we are not there yet. We are still you not know, brainstorming like maybe in the case of Colin about the best way to be able to approach this. But it's interesting to see that African countries are really taking this seriously. Thanks, Sampra. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thanks, Pemba, once more for giving us the scenario exactly what is it what it is indeed in uh, uh, South Africa, Kenya, and indeed uh, Uganda in reference to the smart cities. Uh, those who are watching us, it is just great to know that there are always concerns, even as uh, we purpose to transform uh, our cities, get smart, and of course, uh, aspects that relate with the data centers that have been alluded to earlier here. Colin, May I start with you? What are actually the major concerns that the government could be having as far as uh, data uh, sharing or storage uh, is concerned? Because you may be wanting to speed up this process as much as uh, you, uh, you're concerned as a government, and of course, even the private sector that you are relating uh, with. But there could be some concerns that probably uh, could be uh, snarling your pace. What are these and how do you intend to circumvent around them? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Humphrey. I think critical question. Um, so as a government, we have had questions and conversations around, do you um, run with a private cloud? Do you run with a public cloud, for instance, is the data safe in the cloud? Is our data safe uh, in transit in the cloud? Um, and so the concerns are really around data sovereignty, um, especially when it comes to individuals' data or citizens' data. Um, you know, if the, if the data is out of the country, uh, what assurance do we have as a country that we are protecting our citizens' data and it won't be in the wrong hands? So that question still lingers, and I'm sure there have been many uh, assurances from the multinationals and private uh, firms that have been you know, setting up some of these uh, public cloud uh, infrastructure. Uh, but generally what we have done is that we have gone right now in terms of, uh, of our initial start is that we have a private government cloud, which means data is in country. All government data is in country. Most banks actually have in, in country data. And what this does is that we are saying, you know, data for now for the country, unless we have full assurance 
on transit encryption and security, we will want to have our data residing in country. And I think that's been a major um, conversation. However, we've uh, also come up, of course, with the Data Protection and Privacy Act, which then you know, puts guidance around data, data sharing, which is really, really critical in terms of uh, can data move uh, you know, between different data producers and, and those who are consuming it. And so we put some legislation, but also gone ahead to implement this cloud, private cloud as a government, as a way to provide cloud services, but in-country cloud services. But we have also seen a push by multinationals who are saying we can actually come and provide on-premise, uh, on-cloud cloud services. So in a sense, we can bring um, cloud services as they would have been seated in the US or whatever it is, but residing within the country. And that in a way begins to solve the concerns that we have as a country. We're saying that if you can provide us the same capacity, the same functionality, but in country, I think that brings us, um, that brings us the comfort we need. So Humphrey, I must end by saying, I think that the whole trust and, and, and maturity you know, comes with time, it's a journey. But as a government for now, we are recommending data will be in country and we have implemented that. And we're also working with any partners who are willing to have resident cloud services in our country uh, as a good start. So that's basically, uh, I think our major concern is data privacy and, and confidentiality. Thank you, Andre. Thanks so much, Colin. Very, very insightful uh, indeed on what the status and what you are doing uh, around it. And in fact, even the invitation of other private sector players or multinationals to come in the country so that you can partner to have this kind of trust developed. Temba, what's the scenario like in uh, South Africa in reference to the same uh, concerns? Yeah, Humphrey, I'm, I'm, I must say that uh, uh, I think it's, 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 it's a concern by each and every government uh, really to say, you can't just take the data of your citizen and then just put it in some cloud and in the in the in the in the name of service delivery. Um, government departments, uh, government in South Africa, um, like any other government, we are very much worried about where this data might be residing. Okay, and then that's why, as I, as I indicated earlier on, that the policy that we are coming up with is trying to give clarity and leadership to everyone to say, okay, fine, because we need to embrace this technology. We, we can't avoid it. But in the process of implementing this, this is what is expected of us and what data can be put in those stuff. But it's, it's most certainly, uh, for instance, one of the things that uh, the, the, this policy is, is, is stating is that at least you must make sure that a particular copy of your data is residing in this country. And then you can't put a classified data in maybe in a cloud that might result in to that data maybe being kept in a, in, a, in, a, in a different country. So yeah, I think this is generally a concern by all the, by, by, by all the government departments. But I think as more, as, as more time goes on, we'll be able to move around this and be able to understand it better and be able to implement it better in a secure way that will make sure that we don't compromise the privacy and data of our, of our citizens. Thank you. Uh, th th thanks so much, Femba. Uh, uh, quite an excellent uh, input in terms of the status again in there. Uh, perhaps when I'm swinging to Richard, I'll ask a double fold question about the status of the same in reference to the concern, but also tell us now about the future um, and how you're preparing the youth to be active participants in the digital transformation journey, taking into account that cloud is one of the major technologies that you would like to still uphold. We, I take note that uh, Uganda started the journey of uh, cloud um, deployment of cloud technologies 10 years ago, as, had, as we had earlier heard from Colin, uh, but how does Kenya intend to up its game 
uh, on this by involving the youth uh, going forward? First, begin by telling us the concerns that you could be having. Uh, uh, thank you, Humphrey. Just like my colleagues have said, uh, uh, data is a critical national asset and there's always need for the country to safeguard it. That is why in our national ICT policy, we say that uh, citizen data should reside in the country. Then we went ahead and <clears throat> came up with what we call a critical information infrastructure, where we looked at systems that we thought are very critical to the running of the country. Things to do with water, health services, economy, or which can result in fatalities or casualties or can disrupt the money market. You can think of, for example, a mobile market and pests uh, if when it goes down for even half an hour, it causes severe disruptions in the economic activities of the country. So we are not only as a government looking at our own data centers, but we are also insisting that even private data centers should adhere to some certain standards that we give them. Now, when it comes to the youth, what we have done is that we have come up with several programs. We are trying to, uh, to encourage the youth to use part of our data centers. We have what we are calling white boxes and sub boxes where the youth can come and test the innovations. We seem to be uh, losing Richard. Richard, we seem to be losing you. <laughs> Richard. Uh, I guess at uh, this juncture, let me request uh, Colin uh, just to tell us now about the youth and the future engagement as far as uh, Uganda is concerned uh, with this particular technology, because ideally, having done 10 years so far, there's always the need just to ensure that they, we can do better, even as we project into the future. Colin, if you can hear me, sir. Yes, uh, can you hear me also? Y yes, I can, thanks. Great, great. So anyway, I think uh, the, the future is clear. We, we really need to get uh, services out to everybody. And I mentioned 80% in, in the beginning. I think you did hint what happens to 20% also. Um, we really feel that we were building, we were doing the building blocks, as I hinted to you earlier. But ideally, our target is to really get government-centric you know, e-services to every citizen uh, out there. And this means not just extending the 4,000 kilometer fiber you know, to 7,000, 8,000, cover the full country. Uh, we also want to have to make sure that, you know, do citizens have affordable uh, smartphones? Because then you have a wonderful cloud uh, uh, data center with services that are shared and running for e-governance, but do you actually have uptake uh, by the citizen? So I think more affordable internet is going to be critical for this uptake. Um, you know, more affordable smart devices, not just any phone, but a smartphone device, which is really the, the, the key to penetrating uh, further internet in the country. And even the adoption of technology in Uganda is being driven by really a smartphone on our citizens. Can we get more affordable smartphones in the hands of, of our citizens uh, throughout the country? Can we find a $30, uh, you know, great smartphone that has a payment plan, you know, so our citizens? Because it's one thing to build this great cloud technology, as I mentioned, and right now that's been built. And we're trying, we are also doing disaster recovery as a service. We are now doing platform as a service. We're doing infrastructure as a service, software as a service. But these are great and they're all, you know, at the center. But do we have uptake happening, you know, with, with the citizens? And, and so we're also thinking, for instance, can we have one-stop centers now uh, with the population in the rural areas? If you can't afford a smartphone, at least walk into a one-stop area. I know Kenya has, you know, uh, centers like those. You know, walk there and actually be able to access online government services for a start uh, before you can actually access um, uh, these services. And lastly, we are cognizant that Africa has a very, very, very young uh, population. 
I, right now I'm in my early 40s, but I am in the last 10% uh, of the population demographics. So 90% of Ugandans are younger than me. And these are tech savvy, these are technology fast, cloud fast, smart fast citizens. So the government is just working fast to try to catch up with uh, these mobile fast uh, citizens. So we must do a lot more in terms of making sure that our data centers, our cloud services are more available, but they have the more relevant e-government services that can be consumed by our citizens. So a lot more to be done, Humphrey, a lot more to be done. Thanks, Colleen. I will take that as you are part of your closing remarks. And I'll just, I, I'm, I'm really being prompted that our time is up, but uh, not before giving you at least 39 seconds, uh, both Richard and uh, Pemba, just to make some closing remarks on the same. Uh, please uh, just bear with us. Uh, lean seconds, but I think you can nail it, sir, in closing. Richard first. Oh, thank you. I had a disconnect somewhere with my system. So I, I, I think I lost track on something. Uh, but uh, just like my colleague has said uh, that there's a lot of potential from our youth. And what you need to do is to provide them with the capacity so that now they can even get employment. They can even come up with innovative systems and so forth. So as a government, we are trying to give them infrastructure. Uh, we have tried to give them even uh, uh, like uh, what you call the constituency innovation hubs where we have even have the computers there and then they can go learn a skill they can also uh, even utilize their skills for example making apps so that we have the data centers which are connected to those constituency innovation hubs we also have what some a program you're calling a jira where we connect them with other platforms where they can get employment but because they don't take a lot of time uh, possibly <laughs> we, we could bear with that for the moment thank you Humphrey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Temba closing. Just 40 seconds, please. 40 seconds. Okay, no, thanks. Um, uh, what I want to try and highlight, I highlight uh, as government in Africa, particularly, is that when we develop systems, we should not be developing systems which will require our citizens to leave the comfort of their homes, come to our offices, and queue there in order to have their details captured and so forth. We should start thinking about this, this e-government, we should take it seriously and start developing those systems which are for citizens, for citizens using their cell phones, whether it's our youth, whether it's everyone. Using your cell phone, you can be able to uh, capture, uh, log in, do whatever you want to access, whatever data, uh, process whatever you want to process. Yeah, if we could do this like that, just to summarize, as government departments, as government in Africa, we need to develop systems for our citizens, not for ourselves. Thank you. Thanks. Gentlemen, uh, it's quite, it's been a privilege and in fact, a great learning session equally from myself and I believe to the audience who uh, managed to join this session. Mr. Colin Mugasha, Richard uh, Kerry from uh, Kenya, and uh, Mr. Pemba Nguni from uh, South Africa, much appreciated. And now I swing it all back to Babana Bhatia, uh, back to the Trescom uh, studios. Thank you. Thank you so much, Humphrey. And uh, what an excellent moderation that was. Thank you for your valuable time. Thank you, Colin, Richard, and uh, Temba for your insightful uh, takes on all the questions which were presented. Thank you for being so patient with all your answers. A big thank you once again.